You're listening to Life of the Record, classic albums told by the people who made them. My name is Dan Nordheim. Built to Spill formed in Boise, Idaho in 1992 by Doug March, Brett Netson, and Ralph Youts. Their debut album, Ultimate Alternative Waivers, was released on CZ Records in 1993. For their next album, March changed the lineup to include former bandmates Brett Nelson and Andy Capps, and also started working with producer Phil Eck. There's Nothing Wrong With Love was released on Up Records in 1994. Built to Spill signed with Warner Brothers before beginning work on their third album, this time with Peter Lansdowne on drums, and March playing all of the other instruments. Dissatisfied with the results, March brought back in Brett Nelson and new drummer Scott Pluff to record the album a second time. After the tapes from those sessions got damaged, they ended up recording the album a third time. Perfect From Now On was eventually released in 1997. In this episode, for the 25th anniversary, Doug March looks back on how Perfect From Now On came together. This is the making of Perfect From Now On. Hi, this is Doug March from Built to Spill, and we're talking about Perfect From Now On. I think when we made Perfect From Now On that I had an idea that I was at least trying to make a perfect record, whatever that means. Well, when my wife and I were kids, we didn't know each other, but we both happened to do the same thing, which was tell ourselves that we were going to be perfect from now on, and that meant you know, maybe no more swearing or that we would like do our homework every night or, you know, not get our finger pinched or something. And it was always an ideal that we kind of thought was real that you could actually do. And as you grow up, you realize you can't actually do that, but you can't really help but try. It was the first time that Built to Spill made a record that we had time and the, the budget and expectations to make a good record. You know, everything I'd done up until that point was just punk rock, you know, just going in there and knocking it out and, you know, and, and having fun, having more fun back then because this was the first time that I made a record that. I knew there was going to be an audience beyond my family and a few friends, you know. And so there was a little, there's some pressure from that, you know. Not not pressure to, like, make a hit record, just pressure to make a decent record, you know, a record that deserved to be heard by strangers. At that time in my life, and still, still to this day probably, to some degree, I, I'm not a very good musician and a very good singer, 
So being in the studio is a real struggle for me. And playing live shows, I just kind of let it go, and I, I'm pretty comfortable because I, for one thing, I can't really hear what I'm doing that well. <laughs> but when I'm in the studio, I really struggle to like try to get things to sound good. I would do, you know, 30, 40 takes of a guitar riff or a, or a vocal take, you know, and it's often really discouraging, you know, laying down a track and then going into the control room and listening to it. I'm rarely ever not disappointed by what I've done. So making records has always been, you know, and there's moments of it that are great and fun and like you would imagine them being, you know, like the, the looks like when you see a documentary about about a band and, you know, how exciting it is. For me, there's moments here and there of that, but mostly it was just a lot of pulling teeth. When I first wrote the songs, I demoed them all out on like a cassette eight track. And then when it was time to make the record, I wanted to... I basically wanted to do all the instruments myself and just find a drummer, which is the instrument that I don't know how to play at all. And so I found a drummer and we went and recorded stuff and I felt like I really wasn't as good as I thought I was on the bass and it felt like it uh, didn't wasn't congealing to me. It just sounded kind of like a little bit of a mess. So we worked on the record, though, for I don't know how long, maybe a month or something, a few sessions. And we ended up actually using Made Up Dreams from, from that first session with Peter on drums and me, me on the bass and stuff. But then decided to get Brett Nelson, who had played bass on There's Nothing Wrong With Love. And he's like, he's like my childhood friend who got me into playing music, kid I grew up with. And, you know, we had our first bands together and stuff. So... I wanted him back in the band because he's someone that I could really lean on and trust. And then for a drummer, I wanted to just start, I wanted to start over. I didn't, I think Peter did a good job who played the drums and he probably did a great job, but I was so, I just wanted a clean slate. And so I wanted to get a different drummer. And then that's when Calvin Johnson recommended Scott Pluff. And I didn't really think he would fit what we were doing. But I just liked him so much, and then I really started to love his drumming. We rehearsed for a while, and we recorded the record, all the basic tracks, and in Seattle with Phil Eck. And then we decided to do overdubs in Boise, and Phil drove down to Boise with the tapes, and we started recording, and the tapes were kind of like they're like leaving a little bit of dust tape dust on the tape machine. I guess it was, the tape was kind of shredding and slowly dying, you know, I guess, and we weren't really sure why or how exactly it happened. We thought maybe it was from him driving in a hot car that distance, or maybe it was just did the different tape machines or a bad batch of tape. We didn't really know. And we also weren't totally sure if, uh, if the tapes were going to shred any worse, you know, like, but we just were afraid that, that that they might, and we didn't want to take a chance of of doing a bunch of work, and then the tapes not really working. And also, we we thought at that time too that maybe we could do a little better job. You know, that was my thought was if we we gave it another shot, but having done it and listening to it a bunch, um, and maybe having a little bit more rehearsals, that the band could play the songs a little better. So that's why we ended up scrapping it that second time. And then, uh, yeah, then third time, third time we just muscled through it. signed to Warner Brothers, I was definitely conflicted about signing to a major label. And for different reasons, you know. Yeah, I mean, part of it was that 
I wanted like the money we made to be in our community, you know, to make money for friends. And part of it was, you know, making sure that we got a decent cut of our money. And part of it was just the, yeah, the idea of being bought by a corporation, you know, that really doesn't care that much about art on a level, you know. So I talked to a lot of people and got people's opinions and stuff. And again, Calvin Johnson was another person that I, I went to and he was for me doing it. And that was kind of a big thing. But the bottom line was once I saw that I could get enough money to quit my day job by signing to Warner Brothers, it was, I think it was pretty much done at that point. We signed right when, you know, like the year that my son was born or the, I guess maybe the next year. Yeah, at the, at the time when I signed to Warner Brothers, my thought was that I didn't want to go on tour. I wanted to stay home. And I thought with, with signing to a major label, I could afford to stay home and make records and uh, that be my livelihood, at least for a while. I, this, this was something I didn't think was going to go on for, you know, I didn't think I was going to have a career. I thought I was going to have a few years to be able to, you know, try this out until they realized I wasn't going to sell enough records. That was definitely something that that was a conscious thing for me was to not sound like grunge or other things that were going on at that time. And that was the case with the first Built to Spill record and There's Nothing Wrong With Love was definitely all about not wanting to sound like grunge. And this record was as well, not wanting to sound like other bands in the 90s trying to do our own thing. This record, had long songs and ambitious musical goals, partially because I kind of wanted a record that was not going to be commercially successful or in a way that a corporation could like, would shove music down people's throats. I didn't want them to try to sell our stuff to people. I wanted, I wanted our music to grow in a, you know, natural, organic, way um and for people to hear us because someone recommended us a friend recommended us and they heard something and thought it sounded good i didn't want them to listen to us because we got played on the radio 50 times in the day and then and people you know eventually like oh, okay i've heard this so many times i guess i like it and then oh, i've heard this song so many times i don't like it anymore you know i i, I wanted to our music to get into people the way that the music I loved got into me, you know, not being shoved into our throats through radio and MTV or whatever. There was definitely a conscious decision to try to make a record that wasn't going to um, go too far. <laughs> so in a way it was that, in a way it was a, in a way it was just like what I wanted to do musically, the music I was listening to and things I liked. And part of it was just like having a budget and and having an opportunity to experiment and try some things like this. So there's a few different things that led to the kind of music that ended up on the record. You know, I feel like for some reason that I always knew Randy was going to be first, like from the get-go. Well, this song was um, had the working title Unwound for until the record was ready to go. And because to me, it reminded me of the band Unwound, just this sort of, 
kind of pretty but dissonant, simple little guitar line. So yeah, Randy describes Eternity is the way that a youth group uh, teacher, religious uh, class thing I went to when I was a, a kid in junior high school, just, just describing eternity to us. And it, just the image stuck with me. And I've heard from other people since then that it's, you know, there's, there's slight variations on that metaphor for different, you know, in different religions and stuff. And that song too is like, uh, um, you know, Brett, Brett Netson plays guitar on all the wah guitar. And that really, we, we finished the record at some point and decided we need, we need some help on this. Like this, we need something to push it over the edge. And that's what Netson did. On all the old records, I wanted everything, every instrument to be clear, to be able to hear what everyone's up to. But I don't know if that aesthetic really makes that much sense or is that important, you know? The older that I get, I think that the way things blend together and things disappearing into each other is just as interesting as being able to clearly hear what everyone's up to. Another thing with this record is I think that if it had sounded the way that I wanted it to sound, it might actually be a more boring record. I think that part of its, you know, what sets it apart is the weirdness of it, the, the like shortcomings. Like people say in art, like the things that you can't draw very well, those are what make your style. And I feel like that's kind of the way it is with this record and my music, that the things that I'm not very good at are kind of what make it interesting. And I think Scotty's a really great drummer. I always kind of wanted to push him into being more of a classic rock drummer and putting in more roles and stuff. And he always kind of thought that was sort of show-offy or something. <laughs> and he'd just keep things really basic and, you know, just keep, like, not basic, but he, he was just into doing patterns and not really doing too much extra fills and stuff. And I think that gives it a cool, I think that's a really cool part of it, you know, that... At the time, I was a little disappointed, but looking back at it, I think it gives it a, you know, it's another one of the weird things about it that makes it interesting. Yeah, I think that if I made it the way I wanted it to be, it would sound like, uh, you know, like Oasis or something, like, which I don't, is not what I wanted, you know, not really what I want to sound like and what I want my music to be like. But just what I think it would have just been more conventional, like a more conventional sort of big, pop production, you know? I Would Hurt a Fly is one of my favorite songs for sure. It seemed like it kind of came pretty naturally as a written song. It's, it's kind of uh, based on sort of a weird chord shape. Sometimes that's enough to make a song interesting to me. I don't know, I was kind of imagined it like a, like a lounge song or something, or like a, not a lounge song, but like, you know, Tony Bennett or something singing it. Like it's, it kind of reminds me of that sort of a song.
that was a song that I I think the bass part is Brett plays bass, but I think I wrote all the bass parts because I had written it for when we did it, you know, when I did it in the first place and had like really specific bass parts that I wanted. There's a few songs on the record that I wanted Brett to play the things that I had written, but most of it is Brett coming up with his own stuff, Brett Nelson. You know, it was, it was one of the songs, I guess, that we needed some help. So John McMahon and Brett Netson came in to help that song out a lot. John has that incredible cello solo with really kind of strange dissonant notes and stuff. And then Brett has his wah, kind of bluesy wah, helped, helped the song a lot. Kind of a little bit of nonsense and just, you know, obviously a really, a really kind of obvious turn of the phrase, you know, you know, the, the lyrics I like the best are the let you go to sleep, feeling bad as me. That Those are the lyrics that I thought were really good. That to me, that's the most powerful part. I like that part, too, because, again, it's the chord shapes, then the chord shapes that are that song are the main part of this song. And then it's a variation of those chord shapes that came up with that really pretty chord progression and melody you know sometimes i you know stumble across something that just sounds really nice to me and that, that's one of my favorite ones I think actually another reason why the songs became kind of longer and ambitious in that way was because I felt like I had certain parts that didn't warrant making a whole song out of. And so I'd stick them to, into a song and, and a lot of them became, grew into long, drawn out, weird songs just because I didn't think any of the parts were good enough to carry a whole song, but you threw them all together and it made this inter interesting kind of almost collage kind of song. Yeah, Stop the Show, that's a song that we're playing currently. And to me, that was the beginning of Stop the Show it was kind of like, to me, the coolest sounding thing on the record. Like, this is what I want our music to sound like. remember how these songs came together. I know that when I write songs that are long like that now, I take a bunch of little ideas that I have and just try them out with each other. So I'll have all these different ideas. I try them out with each other and change the key or the tempo or the time signature of one part to see if it'll fit in this other song. It's just a bunch of that. I think that's, that's probably how all these songs came to be, all the long ones. 
I think it was really difficult for Scott and Brett to um, wrap their head around what I was trying to do with these songs. And they did a really amazing job. And they, they learned the songs pretty quickly. And that's where I think that the second recording with them really benefited, was that they had some time to really live with the songs and get them into their heads and not be thinking about when the next part's coming, but it coming more naturally. That song was called Nirvana because it sort of is just like a rock, just like to me it was like a grunge song, but it was also a Beatles thing, you know. That was a, a song that I wrote the bass part for um, when it goes into the verse, the kind of you know walking, bubbly kind of walking bass part. There it might even be totally ripped off from a specific Beatles song. I can't think of what, but this record was probably more influenced by Beatles than anything. And yeah, again, it's one of those songs where I had a lot of little ideas and didn't really want to make a whole song out of them. Like the kind of the end part, the after a while, they know your style, that whole part. You know, that was just like, this part's cool, but I don't want to make a whole song out of it. By the time we were, we, I was working with those guys, even by the time I was working with Peter, the songs were pretty set. I mean, there might have been a few adjustments later on, a few edits here and there. Um, definitely like the end of Stop the Show, you know, kind of disappears and comes back with some weird sounding drums and whatever. That was something that was some later on edit type of situation. But for the most part, these songs are pretty well, pretty well established as far as the parts go. And then, and then it was a matter of like just coming up with overdubs and things like that. But the, you know, the structure of the song was, was definitely there. Yeah, those guys did a really great job because, you know, I had sort of a little bit of a vision, not super detailed, but I, you know, I had an idea of what these songs felt like. And those guys, you know, they didn't really know. You know, there's so many times where by the time the record's done and they're like, oh, that's what this song, you know, is. I had no idea. I didn't know that this was what you were going for. This was the feel of it. Those guys learned the songs from me just showing them to them. They didn't learn them from these demos. I didn't even let anyone hear them. They were just for me. You know, around the year 2000, maybe, I uh, did a cleaning and just threw out tons of cassettes. And somehow I kept a few cassettes, but I threw those away. I threw out the masters and the mixes, just like, I never want to hear this again. These are horrible. And I think it would be pretty funny to hear them again. But yeah, I threw it all away. One of the few things I regret in a weird way that because I think they'd be interesting. I know, I know I did a lot of weird stuff on them. Like there's like some drum machine stuff and making like sounds with my mouth for instruments that I to keep, just to have ideas of things. I mean, we made this record. We spent this all this time and made this record and so much better than these demos were. 
I don't want to hear these and no one would want to hear. There's no reason for these demos to be. And then, you know, now I have an appreciation for crappy versions of things and demos and stuff. And I think it would be, it would be interesting because they're so different, you know, but anyway, they're gone. Another thing is Built to Spill didn't really have a sound. I didn't have a sound. I didn't have an amp that I used or guitar or any kind of pedals that were like my sound. Every record was different. You know, the first record to the second record to this record. I didn't want them to sound the same and I didn't have a way that I wanted a guitar to sound. I liked all different kinds of guitar sounds. So, you know, it took, a, it took a while to figure that stuff out and to sort of fine tune it. And it's something where, you know, I didn't know what I wanted, but I could tell if I, it was what I didn't want and had vague, a vague idea of, of what I wanted it to be. You know, Phil, the producer, was really helpful for that stuff. Yeah, and again, that was mostly Phil. I mean, I, I really didn't know how to dial up a guitar tone, you know, or know what amps do what other than just like the most basic things distortion and delay or whatever but yeah the record before that all the stuff before it I was basically just using the studio like a four track and I didn't even care about having reverb or having having things feel like you were in an environment or anything you know to me it was almost like uh direct like on there's nothing wrong with love I don't think there's any reverb on that record on any instrument at all and that was kind of my weird choice that Phil somehow went along with. But on this record, yeah, we wanted it to be more atmospheric and, you know, I don't, you know, I can't really remember how we did it, but I, I know that mostly it was Phil dialing in guitar tones, moving, moving microphones, just little tiny bits and stuff. And I couldn't even tell the difference, you know. It's like the more you turn it up, the better it sounds to me. <laughs> Made Up Dreams is the song that we, was one of the songs that we recorded that was on tape that we thought might be damaged. And that's what makes me, makes me unsure if the tape really got damaged, you know, because we were able to work on that song and mix it and it worked fine, you know. And, you know, that that's another one of my favorite ones. That's a song that we, we, we're not playing it currently, but it's a song that, you know, the band always has played live. It's got that, it's got Rob Roth, Mellotron on it. That's really a nice part of the song. Some of the words are nonsense. The beginning is just a bunch of nonsense, just something to sing. I like the chords and, you know, there's some of my favorite words. The title was uh, a friend of mine just gave me some song titles and then I wrote a song around the, the song title. Yeah, my friend Wayne Flower, he was, uh, he was the drummer in my old band Tree People. He was in the Halo Benders a little bit and stuff. There's some stuff that I'll paint over and, you know, a lot of songs too, I'll write like a lot of lyrics and try it out with a bunch of different things and then eventually 
come up with some other lyrics. I'm, every once in a while, I'll hear some old demos of something that I've worked on, and I even forgot that I had totally a whole different set of words for the whole song. Sometimes you just sing a line and it doesn't really mean anything or make much sense, but it just sounds right, you know, like the Beatles or something, where it's like, it's just, it just sounds right. The, just the way the vowels and consonants come out of your mouth. My whole thing with lyrics has always been that if you just don't want to write horrible lyrics, if you, if they're not horrible, then the music will give them strength and, and they, they will resonate with people even if they don't mean anything, as long as they're not a drag or offensive or whatever. But at the same time, of course, who doesn't like a really good lyric too? And if I can come up with one of those every now and then to, you know, hold it all together or, or steal one from one of my friends or my wife. To my mind, there isn't like a theme or a, fee a thing that I was going through at that time. But of course there sort of was, you know, um, a lot of stuff I wrote with my wife and like the the album title is uh, something that we both kind of came up with and it was something that we both did when we were kids where we would just decide, okay, I'm gonna be perfect from now on. And she kind of had that same feeling growing up and so, and you know, a lot of, a lot, there's a lot of her lyrics and just things that came out of discussions with her that ended up on the record. Yeah, my main memory of um, Velvet Waltz is uh, there's like a vibrato or tremolo guitar going through the whole song. And we had recorded the drums and bass. And so we wanted this tremolo guitar going through it. And we didn't record to a click track. So keeping the, the tremolo to be in sync with the drums and bass was really tricky. And we just had to like piece it together and it took hours of me just playing the guitar and there's just a limited amount of tape space so we couldn't use a bunch of tracks and have a bunch of tracks or playlists or whatever to choose from and or or, or move things around on a computer and line it up it all had to be kind of just done live and for a lot of it um, my good friend Chris Dacchino he ran up records and he was in the studio sitting there like turning the knob on the tremolo pedal like trying to keep it in sync with the song This was before digital was really being used to make records. I mean, digital was being used for mastering and like the editing and sequencing and that kind of stuff. But as far as for making, uh, make, doing the recording, the multi-tracking, it wasn't really happening back then. I mean, maybe Michael Jackson or someone was starting to do it, but no, that w it wasn't, this was, this was the way records were all made at this time. Yeah, recording on the tape was really made this thing really complex. And so a song that's like, you know, twice the length of a regular song doesn't take twice as long to work on. It takes like 10 times as long because you're, you have to start sharing these tracks. So, so many of these songs have like, you know, the first half of the song, there's a guitar on this track. And then the next part, there's some percussion. And then another part of the song, there's another guitar track that's totally a different sound and needs to be panned to a different spot and EQ'd differently or whatever, you know? So there's like, 
a lot of like moves that had to be made. And this was the first record that we made that we used a automated mixing board because it was just so complex that things had to be, yeah, every, not every track, but many of the overdub tracks would be like, yeah, guitar in one part, vocal on another part, a backup vocal or something, you know, and something else here, trying to keep that all organized, you know. We have all these pieces of paper with, you know, all these things written on it, trying to keep it all organized, me and Phil both, trying to wrap our brains around what was even there, you know. It's called Velvet Waltz because there's no there's no hi hat on it, and that's like a Velvet Underground thing. And that this was a song to me that was a working title, Velvet Waltz, like unwound in Nirvana. Like it wasn't really a title, and I wanted to change the title, and then just sort of like, oh, I can't think of anything good. That seems all right. Uh, in fact, the the record I, I wanted the record not to have any titles, any song titles and tried to do that and just realized it was going to be too much of a pain in the ass to try to not have any song titles on the record. You know, I was inspired by that Butthole Surfers record, Hairway to Steven, and instead of song titles, it just had pictures on the thing. Like one was some picture, two was another weird picture. And I can't remember why I thought that it couldn't be done. Like I was just thinking maybe like for getting played on the radio or you know, for the CD, for a CD, and there had to be something that showed up in the thing. And maybe like, and then I think Butthole Surfers did put names to those songs, you know, or they, I know that they did um, eventually. It's like, I don't know, for some reason, I just thought it was going to be, cause more trouble than it was worth. And just, you know, in a way, it seemed kind of like people would be, think it was annoying and bratty to do that. <laughs> and this is a song again that Brett Netson, you know, plays an epic guitar solo at the end of that really, to me, just makes the song. And a little bit of John McMahon on cello. It's another one that got both of those guys to come turn it into something special. Just nets and ripping. I don't know what he was thinking. Brett, I feel like Brett just came in for a day or two and just flew in and just laid down all his stuff. He laid down a bunch of stuff and then I kind of just picked and chose what I thought was cool from what he laid down. Like he played a lot more than what ended up on the record. I can't think of me playing any wah stuff on this album. I think it might be all him. There might be a thing or two of me, but yeah. Anything that anything that sounds like Jimi Hendrix is is him. song out of sight i like the song pretty well except there's a funky part <laughs> that i'm just a little bit embarrassed about but i like the intro those weird chords it's like a major chord going to a minor chord it's like a kind of cool beatles thing that's kind of the best part of the song to me is just the major to minor simple chord thing 
And you know, just a lot of nonsense words on this one. <laughs> I like this song, except I don't like the kind of funky part. It's like the, um, I know that you'll get yours when you, when you get something. I know. It's like kind of a, I don't know. Yeah, it's just, just the funkiness, just the kind of, and I know there's a little, there's a little bit of that too on There's Nothing Wrong With Love. There's some kind of stuff like that. It was kind of before I had an aesthetic against funky white music. <laughs> And I like the punk part, but I never felt like we did a, quite a very good job of it, or I couldn't sing it very well and stuff. It was so hard to sing. It killed me trying to sing this song. To me, the lyrics and Kicked It in the Sun, like the lyrics that begin the song are just about hanging out in Boise. Like um, there's a feeling from Ada to Irene. Those are, those are a couple of streets in my neighborhood, like stretching 10 blocks or something. And it's sort of like just being, just living in Boise and staying up late at night, writing songs. And that's kind of what... Uh, the beginning of the song reminds me of and maybe just some nonsense to sort of throw it together. And then the kicked it in the sun part is nothing, just some words that sounded good. The phrase that just popped into my head for no reason and just sounded kind of musical. I think it has that connotation of like relaxing in the sun, but I don't know what it means, but to me it didn't mean that. It meant more like kicking something into the sun, like just like, just, yeah, like destroying something. made the record I was like so self-conscious and did not want anyone from the label coming down to the studio to like hear what we were up to because it was it felt like we were just like didn't know what the fuck we were doing and just like I don't know like the stuff was taking a long time to take any kind of shape that sounded like a good record and so the guy who signed us our A&R our guy uh, Joe McEwen he was really a really cool guy and just let us do it the way we wanted to do it. And then he came in to listen to it. He just he came to Seattle when we finished mixing and we were like our last day in the studio or something. And he came down and we just played him the whole record. And he just like, I think he just stood there the whole time, listened to the whole record, stood there and kind of played some air guitar. And just at the end of it was like, you know, 
it's like that's great that was kind of it you know i i don't know if anyone there even knew about us except him <laughs> you know i don't know if anyone had any kind of expectations in any way I think we really, we flew under the radar at Warner Brothers. I don't think people paid that much attention to what we were doing. And the people that did were like people that were art, you know, music people that, that, that trusted us and didn't expect us to do anything except what we wanted to do. Yeah, we stayed within our budget. But instead of, instead of pocketing a little bit of money at the end of it, we just spent, spent the whole budget on the record instead of having some money left over. Yeah, at some point, I can't remember what it was in reference to, but my wife said, well, we're special in other ways, ways our mothers appreciate. And uh, yeah, I thought it was hilarious and thought it would make a good lyric in a song. And then the, then the end song that it goes into, the other lyrics sort of go along with that theme of like, I can't remember now the lyrics. It's something about being mediocre, you know? Like, oh, his, his master plan was mediocre. Just like, you know... Just trying hard to do something rad and, you know, it's just okay. You know, we, we do the best we can, but not, not all of us are capable of doing amazing things. Yeah, artistically and maybe in other parts of our lives too, trying to just do something incredible and amazing and inspiring and then coming up with something that's pretty good, you know. Because you're trying so hard, you're shooting for such a high ideal you're not going to get there, but you're going to do something that's, you know, pretty good. <laughs> if you don't, if you're not shooting for that super high ideal, you're going to really suck. So you got to shoot for that really high thing in order to do something that's passable. And that's, that's just the best that most of us can hope for, you know, best that most of us can do. There's a handful of people that are geniuses or just really, for whatever reason, can do things that just, you know, are amazing. But for most of us, it's, trying and you know trying to get some joy out of trying Yeah, the first part was something I remember just kind of, that was one that I wrote a lot of the bass parts and stuff. It was something I remember just four tracking and putting together. And yeah, and lyrically, lyrically untrustable. You know, it's one of the few songs that kind of is like sticks to one subject through the whole song, kind of. We're talking about a person and just the, just how flawed people are, I guess. You know, myself. Maybe maybe other people, but yeah, it's was, it was just about people. I mean, it wasn't I wasn't you know nothing serious about myself. <laughs> just just people, just the way that people are, you know, just the limitations to our humanity or something. Chorus of Untrustable is uh, uh, like J.D. Salinger of Franny and Zoe story where they just, then that's like uh, sort of the ending of the story where Franny tells Zoe that the, 
you know, the person that she was performing for, the, you know, is is God. And it's, yeah, it's, it's, it's not a religious thing. It's just like uh, God is in, you know, what matters, who, who matters. I think the second one, I can't remember how they got connected, but yeah, the second part of it is like the less interesting song. Maybe, maybe even something we just sort of saw if we, if it would work, tried it to see if it would work. It's like a really untypical song for me to write. Cause usually my thing with writing songs was about coming up with sort of a, an original kind of chord progression or, melody or whatever and to me the second part of that song is real conventional like it's like a blues thing i think it's like a you know one four five chord progression type of thing but i don't, and I don't remember why i what, what i liked about it or why i thought it was a good idea and i like it fine but it just seems so foreign to how i usually make music or what i like about music for some reason it was satisfying in that song to me That was more about um, my wife and just like struggles with being like um, like too compassionate. It's like, why can't you apathize with Jesus' point of view? Like, why can't you be less compassionate, you know, and just kind of let some things go? Um, why does why do things affect you so intensely? That's what that that song is kind of about, like her. Just uh, suffering because because of because <laughs> she has too much compassion and love for people. I think I'm also compassionate, but I wouldn't let compassion like control me in that way. I wouldn't I wouldn't let I wouldn't let my compassion ruin my day. Sometimes I would, but for the most part, I'd be like, well, that's just the way it is. It sucks, but you know, I gotta live my life and be okay. You know, be okay in this world. You know, I think it's hard. I think it's harder for everyone now than ever. You know, just watching, watching how how horrible things have gotten, and watching people suffer, and you know, you feel guilty and you feel like you want to do something, but you also just have to keep existing. You know. I was talking about some personal things, but I don't know that it was ever like helpful or, you know, I don't feel like it was ever a, an avenue to a dialogue with, for us or anything. It was more, you know, we'd more talk about it. Like what was a good idea for, for a song, like just what made sense artistically, you know, she was someone that I always like would run everything by, you know, every, every idea I had, I would, see what she thought of it because she was the person i trusted more than anyone 
about my music. I felt like she got it and also got music, you know, in general. I met her when I was in high school and she was, she dated um, Brett Nelson. Um, they lived in Twin Falls and I moved up to Boise. And so I met her through him, but we were always really close. And so she was like one of the 10 fans of Farm Days, me and Brett's old band. You know, when we were teenagers in high school. We had a band called Farm Days and we lived in different cities, but we'd get together once in a while and make songs. And so she, she knew my music well from, from the get-go. After we made this record, um, I was going to switch up the lineup, but I just loved playing with these guys. I loved hanging out with them. And I also had just a different idea about what I wanted the band to be. And I wanted the band to get really good and be like a proficient band where we all grew together and became, you know, uh, just super tight and really had a sound that was us. And these were the guys I wanted to do that with. And then I want, I also wanted to collaborate with them. You know, this record, I'd shown them all the songs, but I wanted to make some music where they were writing their own parts. Cause I thought a lot of the bands that I was, a lot of the bands that I thought were good at that time were doing that, you know, like modest mouse unwound and stuff where they'd go into a jam room and, you know, everyone would contribute to the music equally. And that's what we did. We made keep it like a secret, which was, very much based on us all jamming together a bunch. And then, and then there's a big circus ending. <laughs> For some reason, we made some circus music at the end. At the time, I thought it was killer, but, you know, I mean, maybe it's a little bit like that funk part. And I don't know about funk music and circus music and stuff. I like, like, the part where we sound like the Velvet Underground. That's what I think, that's what I wish that I had done with my whole career, was made stuff that sounded more like that and not, not made these sort of musical decisions that were just sort of weird directions that I just don't care much about these days. <laughs> you know, when the record came out, I don't really remember how I was feeling. I don't remember. I think I mostly felt like I was just moving on to the next batch of songs, you know? We'd already started writing Keep It Like a Secret songs and writing together as a band. And I remember being really excited about that. And not really thinking much about perfect from now on anymore and yeah we, we did we, we toured right after the record came out we did none of the songs zero of them we just i just didn't have it in me I just didn't want to at all like none of it sounded any fun at all but mostly i just didn't want to hear those songs again i was so burnt out after making that record and you know i was burnt out on it but at the same time i was, I was proud of it you know and you know like i said Everyone that I worked with was great, and there's no way I could have done it without Phil. He was incredible. I mean, he's such a good producer, and I trust him so much with making things sound good and his musical ideas. And he's also he was also just really supportive and really, like, enthusiastic. And he was like me, too. You know, we had some points where we were just like, he was as done as I was, as burnt out. You know, he'd never done anything like this before either. He'd never spent this much time on a record or done a major label record either. So we were both, you know, had a lot of burnouts. But, you know, he was he cheered me on through the whole thing and really supported me and was enthusiastic about it. The very end of it, I'm trying to think of the name of that song. The, the song that was left off the record. And when we, we were mixing the record and we finally got everything mixed and I was like, what about whatever that last song was called. And he's like, he's like, oh man, I don't want to do that. And we kind of got in a fight because at the very end of it, because he didn't, he did, I was mad at him for not wanting to just like, you know, muscle through this very last song.
When we finished the record, the thing that, th- that meant the most to me about the record was I came away from it thinking that I could make a record no matter what. That no matter how hard it was or, you know, whatever challenges, that in the end it could get done. And, and that was something I, did, I don't think I knew for sure when we started it. Mostly it was like just doubts about whether or not I'm really a musician, you know? Like this might not be my calling or a job for me, you know? This might be just harder than what I'm capable of. And, you know, maybe I can make, you know, some punk rock records or make some home recordings and stuff, but I don't think I really am like cut out to be a professional musician, you know? And by the end of it, but when it was done, I was like, oh, yeah, I can, I can be a professional musician. I can, I can do this. Because I felt really, had a real strong confidence. Like, well, if we just work super hard and you just keep going, and when you don't want to do it, you just keep doing it, you can, you know, we, we, I can do this. And it, that was like a real, a real thing, like a really empowering thing for me, finishing that record. Like I said, I don't really look back at it very often, but just sitting here now looking back at it a bunch, I feel really proud of it. You know, it's like, uh, you know, getting feedback from people like you that enjoyed it means a lot to me, you know, really makes me, that's what makes me proud of it is that people enjoy it, you know. And, you know, over the years, people have told me how much they like it and I don't know, I just feel really, really lucky for that because it just as easily... I wouldn't be surprised at all if just no one really cared about it or it was, you know, a fine record or whatever. So just the fact that some people really like it is <laughs> unbelievable to me, you know. Visit lifeoftherecord.com for more information about Built to Spill. You'll also find a link to stream or purchase Perfect From Now On. Thanks for listening. <laughs>